So we're now going to have a, a poster session. Um, so I'm, I'm going to chat this. My name is Andreas, and Andreas Feist, and I'm from uh, Caltech, IPEC. So how this works is there are three blocks, um, one astronomy uh, block with uh, three poster presenters, and then multi-messenger astrophysics and high energy physics. Um, and uh, each of the presenters has five minutes. Um, we go through them per block. And then after the block, we have five minutes for some questions. OK, so first uh, presenter is Tim Tribute-Tuev from uh, Caltech, um, where he's a research scientist. Dimitri, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Right, can you see it? Correct. Yes. That's good. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks, Andres, for the uh, for the introduction. Uh, once again, my name is Dimitri Duif. I'm a research scientist at uh, the astronomy department at Caltech, and I'm going to present a recent work of ours, which is called Tails. And this is a this is a framework for chasing comets with the Zwicky Transient Facility and Deep Learning. Uh, a few words about the Zwicky Transient Facility for those who are unfamiliar with the survey. So it's an optical time domain astronomy sky survey, state of the art, I would say. Uh, we're at the 48-inch Schmidt telescope at Palomar with a very large uh, detector area. So I'm showing it uh, down here. For comparison, this is the uh, field of view of the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory LSST. Uh, we can we have the capability of scanning the whole uh, northern night sky in one night, and uh, we're doing uh, GR and I filters with a nominal exposure time of thirty seconds. We're getting down to a magnitude of twenty point five or something like that, and um, with an image quality of about two arc seconds again in the R. And the main science drivers of ZTF are listed on this slide. And of uh, interest for us here is the solar system object. So if you're interested to learn more, please uh, proceed to this website, ctfcaltech.edu. And here's the one slide summary of this uh, new web framework that uh, we've developed uh, called Tails. Uh, its aim is to allow DL assisted, deep learning assisted discovery of comets and ZTF data, uh, which has been the primary focus, but in principle in any other uh, sky survey as well. It's using a custom, uh, I'd say highly customized state of the art, efficient debt based architecture. So it's using the efficient debt backbone to do feature extraction and then it passes that through a head network that uh, tells you the probability of a uh, of an image cut out having a comet on it and its position. Uh, we've assembled a very large diverse training set ran active learning for multiple rounds to uh, uh, make it even more diverse and cover the face space as well as we can. So we have uh, several versions of the, uh, of the classifier. Uh, one could operate on image triplets, so the stacks of uh, an epical science image, a reference image, and a difference image. But we also um, we also found that uh, no image differencing is actually required, and we could get essentially the same performance just by using a science and epical science image and a reference image of that field. We get something. We get over ninety nine percent label prediction accuracy, down to very faint magnitudes around twenty, uh, around twenty, I'd say and a one to two pixel median positional RMSC uh, with respect to the uh, comet nucleus position as reported by the JPL Horizons ser uh, service. Uh, we've been uh, running a production service in uh, GCP on the uh, twilight survey data of ZTF for the past two months. And uh, it typically yields like an order of 10 to 20 nightly candidates that need to be uh, looked at, and um, we expect with a few more rounds of active learning that would be uh, reduced even further. And some very exciting. So we actually got got the first ever AI assisted, uh, rather DL assisted comet candidate discovery on October 
27th, CTFDD01. Uh, you can see the discovery image here. So the promise of the TAILS um, system has been that it can find cometary objects in single exposures, and here it is, as opposed to traditionally people uh, look for multiple detections of an, of an object and they fit an orbit and then they would see what, what that orbit would look like. So here in a single detection, followed it up, then 10 stars uh, found pre-discovery image of that uh, object. And so now it's, it's a very well constrained, typical long period um, comet op orbit. And that is it for me. And if you're interested, I have a, have a poster. So with a little bit more details, please feel free to ask questions and contact me for more details. Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, okay, let's go quickly to the next presenter, which is uh, Xiaolong Li. Are you here? Yeah. Okay, so you're a grad student at the University of Delaware. Yeah. So, hi everyone. I'm Xiaolong Li from University of Delaware. I'd like to present my work about uh, light, light echoes. And so the, what is the light echo? Light echoes are the reflection of stellar explosion on interstellar dust. So light echoes can give us a second opportunity to study historical transient and uh, provide us invaluable information about, uh, mm, about uh, mm, interstellar dust. But light echoes are extremely difficult to detect because they are diverse, time very faint, and there are a lot of false positives, like the reflections of telescope artifacts and so on. Um, the current LST alert system is designed for point-like sources. It will entirely miss light echoes. And then the current way to search for light echoes is by visual inspection of thousands of different images from the telescope. In the area of LST, the data volume will be huge. So data mining techniques will, are urgently needed for uh, in search for light echoes. We propose to use the artificial intelligence to address this problem. And uh, one of the most well-established uh, models for image detection are convolutional neural, neural networks, which has proven to be very successful in learning high-level features of, from images, such as shapes, edges, and uh, so on. Uh, and over the past several years, object detection frameworks based on convolutional neural network have reached near uh, human level performance. In this work, we explored the application of two main frameworks, um, the YOLO and the Forster RCN. We collect and assemble the data set from uh, Atlas um, survey, and we very respect more than Mm, 20,000 uh, mm, images, and we found light echoes from about 18 fields, and we uh, built a data set from those fields. We labeled the stars and the light echoes in each image, and uh, light echoes are peers as groups, so we label them as the separate bounding boxes. And in the poster, the plot shows the histogram of number of bounding boxes in each image and also the number of stars and the number of uh, light echoes. So the number of light echoes are much le less, less than the number of stars. Mm. We tried the YOLO and also the first stars and the YOLO is a uh, one stage framework image is passed into just one deep neural net mo model and uh, it make, makes class prediction and bunny box regression uh, at once. Um, for the first RCN, it's a two-stage 
framework. It first uh, extracts uh, regions of interest from feature maps and uh, use another model to for classification and uh, regression. Mm, we have some preliminary results from those two frameworks and, uh, and those two frameworks both can reach uh, human level performance in searching for light echoes in our data set. And, but there are also some challenges. And so the first one is the overfitting problem. Mm. AI models are likely to overfit on our limited data set. And uh, also the class imbalance. In the histogram, you'll see there are more stars than light echoes. And also uh, we plan to solve this by create some synthetic images in the future and also consider the time evolution of light echoes turn our image to image series may offer better opportunities. Yes, that's from me. Thank you. Very cool. Uh, okay, let's go to the last presenter of this uh, session, uh, of this block. Uh, Atina Bodhi, uh, postdoc researcher of the Kong Konkloi Observatory in Budapest, Hungary. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to talk about image-based classification of variable stars. This is kind of a new project because our group just formed in last September and we are pretty new in the field of AI. So we have uh, six astronomers and uh, two people from the field of IT. And that's me in the, in the middle of the picture. So our goal is to classify different kinds of variable stars, but what are variable stars? So we are talking about intrinsic variables like uh, periodically pulsating stars and uh, extrinsic variables like uh, uh, eclipsing binaries when you can see those uh, eclipses. So uh, we have different kinds of stars, which means we have different masses, radii, ages. So the physical structures are different, which means the observed live curves are uh, different, have different shapes, periodicities, amplitudes. And if you plot the live curves, then you can recognize the different uh, kind of variable stars. So our idea is to use those images as you look at them and try to classify those using convolutional neural networks. So uh, in, the, in the community, uh, most of the uh, methods use statistics, like uh, try to find the mean and kurtosis and, the, and Fourier decomposition and other information. Uh, we are not intended to calculate all of these uh, mat uh, matrices, we just want to plot the images at first. So to, to do so, we, we use the Ogle database. Ogle is a project started in 1992 and uh, provided us like uh, millions of light curves uh, with a, a decade-long uh, um, time. So this is a, a good start to train our, our network. Uh, we prepare the data like uh, finding the, the periods and the time of maximum brightnesses to adjust the light curves. But if you use Ogle, you don't have to calculate the Fourier transform most of the time because you can download these informations. And we, we normalize the light curves and uh, uh, create the images like, like, like this one. So if you look at the, the sample size, you can see that in, in case of some subclasses, we have uh, such a few uh, samples. So we, have, we had to do some augmentation. Uh, first, we use the known noise properties to generate new light curves, but right now we are using Gaussian process to, to do the same task. So this is our network 
actually networks because we had an old design we, which is a consecutive convolution, convolution, dropout and pooling layers. And uh, right now we are trying another uh, design uh, which uses deeper consecutive convolution layers. And uh, we are trying to, to, to give uh, the, the known information like the period amplitude and color information as well to, to improve our uh, accuracy. And uh, some words about the results. Uh, this is the uh, result of the old network, uh, which is published in this paper. So you can uh, read the details. And uh, as you can see, we are able to classify the most of the most of the samples uh, with an accuracy better than 90%. And uh, in case of our new network, we are trying uh, to use the uh, new uh, generated likers generated using Gaussian process. So it's uh, it's just initial, but as you can see, we can reach the reach the same uh, accuracy. And if we uh, add some new informations, then uh, we can uh, classify each of the variable classes uh, like almost a uh, hundred percent, which is which is very very promising. So if we are ready, uh, generating the new life curves and uh, trying to find uh, uh, the best uh, architecture, we will publish our, our results later. So thanks for your attention, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so we have now a little bit of time for questions to all of those uh, three presenters. Is there anything you want to know in more detail? So um, your work sounds somewhat similar to doing a detection for gravitational waves, um, where you could also either take images of the waveforms or you could use the time series. And using the time series, they are proved better. So in your case, um, don't you just have access to the time series? And that's why you're going to the images, where everything is quantized usually to um, 8 bits or so? Uh, no, we have the time series. Uh, so there are existing algorithms trying to classify those light curves using the time series, uh, using uh, LSTM and uh, other networks. But uh, we are trying to use something new because uh, yeah, usually we just look at the light curves and we can we can tell, yeah, yeah that, that's that's a that's a, a sample, that, that's a given variable. And we are trying to do the same using a computer. So actually that's the idea. So can we, can we do the same like the human brain does? Okay, now we have uh, one question by uh, Gotham, are you on? Uh, hi, for Jialang, uh, regarding the um, light echoes, have you seen how well they might work with not light echoes, but with lenses around, you know, gravitational lenses uh, in galaxy clusters? Because it seems to me that this is a general purpose arc detector, and it'd be interesting to see if this can find not just the, the light echoes, but other similarly curved structures. Um, for yeah, for, I think it it may also works for other for other uh, objects like galaxies, maybe and uh, gravitational lenses. If we build uh, our data set properly, yeah, I think you might have even a larger data set for things like gravitational lenses than than for light echoes, which is pretty hard to find. Hmm. Yeah, the problem um, is the is to build the data set for the light echoes. It's a rare, rare event, so it's hard to find enough. I guess question? I had a question for the variable star talk at the end. Uh, you mentioned additional parameters. 
Um, could you say a little bit more with uh, what those were? So uh, those were the, the period because uh, we know the period because we want to use it to phase forward the light curves, the, the amplitudes, which is easy to find, and, and, the, and the color information. Actually, we are using uh, the Gaia survey to, to, to get, the, get the colors. Okay, then I have one more for Dimitri. <clears throat> um, can you tell us a bit more how you are training your, your um, algorithms? Are you using different images, colors, or like? Well, so to to assemble um, to assemble the data set, I've identified all the uh, all potential cometary observations in the ZTF uh, from 2018 or something, which resulted, and then selected about sixty thousand uh, individual observations. So, um, sampled that and that sample went through manual uh, inspection and labeling mm -hmm. um, and so the that data set has gr and i images separately so like there's no color information that's mm -hmm. that's used in there and the old yeah so it's it's the science image taken on a given night uh, plus the reference image of that part of the sky and originally we also used difference images but it's apparently not not necessary to be uh, to be using those mm -hmm. very cool yeah and then then several rounds of uh, active learning so we we started with a pretty simplistic uh, resonant based classifier that just says yes or no uh, with that, we were able to expand the data set uh, significantly, <clears throat> both to cover, you know, the face space for the uh, negative examples and to uh, to catch more uh, actual, well, to get to catch the cases where you can tell uh, the morphology. And once that was done, we moved over to more complicated architectures that also pinpoint the location of the of the comet. And mm -hmm. this uh, first ever uh, discovery that I, well, this DL-assisted discovery that I showed. So actually, the uh, if you do the PSF fitting for it, it's something like half an, it's less than half an arc second. It has less than half an arc second uh, pull width at half max. And a tail that you can barely see, like, which extends to like maybe two pixels. And the ZTF pixel is one arc second. Uh, uh, Pixel scale is one one arc second per pixel, so it's it's a pretty powerful tool. That sounds great. Thank you.